to you, Book Club. My name is Lisa Martin. I'm a Southeast Asia correspondent with Asia en France Press, and I'm also the FCCT president. Uh, thank you for joining us on this very special literary evening. Please put your hands together and give a big warm welcome to Pim Wang Te Chawat. Pim is a Thai Chinese writer from Bangkok. Her short stories, poems, and articles have been published in various websites, literary magazines and journals, including the Mekong Review, the Nikkei Asian Review, Dean of Geek, and yes, Poetry. She holds a bachelor degree in English literature from King's College London and graduated with distinction from Edinburgh Napier University in Scotland with a master's in creative writing. She has performed her poetry at events in Edinburgh, hosted by Shoreline of Infinity and the Scottish BAME Writers Network. Her debut novel, The Moon Represents My Heart, was published by One World Publications in the UK this year, with Blackstone Publishing holding the US rights. Television rights were sold after a competitive auction to 21 Laps and Netflix with actress Gemma Chan of Crazy Rich Asian fame set to star and produce. Now I'd like to flag in advance that we will be taking uh, questions from the audience throughout the evening. So uh, please uh, approach the microphone at the back if you have a burning question for Kun Pim. Uh, congratulations on the book and the Netflix uh, deal, Pim, and thanks for joining us here tonight. Thank you so much. First of all, like, thank you so much for having me. I've heard so much about the FCCT, so this is a huge honor for me to be here. So I'm very excited. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with your, your debut novel, can you give us the elevator pitch about uh, the storyline? Yes, the elevator pitch. <laughs> so I always pitch this book as the time traveler's wife meets the Joy Luck Club. So <laughs> <laughs> or the other pitch is that it's kind of like the Richard Curtis movie about time, but with Asian people. So it's about a family of British Chinese time travelers and the story starts when the parents um, named Joshua and Lily go back in time on a trip to the past and they don't come back. So the book follows um, the children, Tommy and Eva, as they deal with that grief and also deal with their own ability to t travel back in time. And another narrative in the book is that we follow the character of the father, Joshua, as he grows up in Hong Kong and then he moves to the UK and meet his wife and they start a family. So it's a it's a book based on my Chinese heritage. So it's a story about confronting your history and finding a way to move forward with hope. So that's sort of the elevator pitch for the book. I'd like you to read a, a short passage from uh, The Moon Represents My Heart, just so we can get a taste of your writing style. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I'll try and find um, one of my um, favorite chapters from the book. It's yeah, so this is um, a very short extract. So this is a, a, a chapter told through the perspective of the parents, Joshua and Lily. And just before I read, I just want to say um, I really enjoy writing this chapter and the love story between the parents because so much of um, the characters are based on my own family members. And I basically, through their romance, I wanted to give my grandparents the love story they never had. So this is um, Joshua and Lily, 1988. So I'm sorry if I pronounce certain things wrong because English is not my first language. Sometimes I struggle to pronounce things correctly. <laughs> so Joshua and Lily, 1988. Timing is imperative when it comes to love. Lily had always believed this. Meeting the right person does not matter if the circumstances are not aligned, if both of you are in different stages of your lives. You might be entangled for a while, sometimes even longer than a while, but eventually the wires will always get crisscrossed or severed. Timing, Lily always said, gives love wings. If timing had not cooperated, she would not have decided to go to that New Year's Eve party at Islington on the last day of 1987. She would never have stood outside, smoking by Pauline's rose bushes and met Joshua, a month or so later, if timing had not been on her side, 
Pauline would not have suggested going for Chinese after class one evening. And they would not have ended up in the restaurant where Joshua worked, exactly when he was working. Lily would not have worn her yellow dress, her turquoise earrings, sat down at the table with her friends and Omar's scarves when he walked briskly over, a notepad and pencil in hand, ready to take the order. His eyes swept over her face, and then he said, he said, just one small change. She and her friends could have gone somewhere else. He could have been assigned a different shift. Her mother could have birthed her a week later. She could have taken a wrong turn down the road once, and they loved would never have materialized. But Joshua would disagree. Love, Joshua said, does not hinge upon timing. Instead, the opposite is true. Why fear time when fundamentally it is what you make of it? If he had not agreed to go with Kevin to that party in Islington, if Lily and her friends had not shown up at his restaurant a month or so later, love would find other ways to bend time to its shape, to its design. Other things would have fallen into place, on a different day perhaps, under a different sky. They would have eventually met, their lives intertwining and molding into one. Fate made it inevitable. She might even be in the same yellow dress, with turquoise in her ears, her face lighting up in surprise as their eyes met. And she would say, she would say, oh, it's you. Wow. I love that, that idea about um, time giving love wings. It, it, it's, it's very powerful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How long did it take to write the book? So it took me like a year and a half. So this book was um, a part of my postgraduate postgrad dissertation. <laughs> so I did my um, postgrad in creative writing, and our dissertation was basically to write the first um, um, 20K of our novel with like a complete chapter breakdown from the first chapter to the last chapter of what happens in the book. So this book started out as my dissertation, and I just sort of continued writing it. And it took me, yeah, like that, a whole a year and a half before like final edits. Yeah. And talk me through the the process of of researching the the historical aspects of the novel. Um, yeah, that is a very interesting question. Um, a lot, like I said, a lot of this book is based on my personal like family history, but also um, based on my own history, like living in London. So I um, I lived in London for like four years. And I've always been fascinated with history, like British history, Thai history. And um, so at first, I started researching my own personal history. So um, a lot of this book is based on um, my Chinese side of the family. So basically, my dad and his dad. So my dad's here tonight as well. This is my dad. <laughs> So, um, Hello, <laughs> Kim's dad and mom. <laughs> yes, so part of the research was that I interviewed my dad about his time growing up in Hong Kong. So that's why a lot of this book is based is, is in Hong Kong, because my dad did grow up in Hong Kong. So I interviewed him about that experience. And also there's a, big, um, a bit of um, the book that's set in the Kowloon War City. So I'm not sure if you're, uh, many people are familiar with that setting, but it's a very sp um, specific place specific like historical place and my dad had the chance of going inside the Kowloon War City so I did um, I interviewed him about that what that was like I watched um, a bunch of documentaries about um, with real footage of what it was like walking through that that place and I also interviewed uh, my dad a lot about his relationship with his dad because at first when I started writing this book it was supposed to be kind of the Asian version of, you know, the, you know, the white dad story you see, in, like the white Hollywood dad story when the son goes like, oh, but it's not your, it's not my dream dad, it's yours. But like <laughs> the Asian version. <laughs> so it was supposed to be a very like father, Asian father and son story. So I did a lot of examination of my own relationship with my dad, my own relationship with my granddad and also, um, my dad's relationship with his dad as well. So that was the personal research. And the historical research is um, 
a lot of it is um, with the time travel back. Um, I've always loved, um, I've always been fascinated by the Second World War. I don't know if this is because I'm just weird <laughs> or because um, growing up in Thailand, it's not a period of history where Thai people get educated on a lot or at all, even though it's such a big event that still, I think still affects the world as a whole today. But in the UK, it's such a big thing, like the Second World War, it's such a big historical thing that people talk about a lot and you see a lot in mainstream movies and TV shows and movies. And, but the aspect that I feel is missing from it is the um, viewpoint or the experiences of people of color especially um, Chinese immigrants doing the Second World War. So a lot of the um, research I did for that, for this book, was mostly examining that experience. So um, there are two museums which were amazing. The Imperial War Museum in Lam Lambeth in London, which was really great. And also the Museum of Docklands in the East End. And I found out that um, the Chinatown in London used to be in the East End, because right now the Chinatown is in Soho for people who've been to London. But during the Second World War, it was in the East End. And if you go to that part of London, even today, you can still see street names in Chinese. And when I was researching that, it just blew my mind, because you, you get to see a lot of stuff that you, you don't really necessarily see in the mainstream. There are pictures of, of Chinese immigrants who were living in Chinatown at that time, and I also came across this very fascinating story about Chinese sailors who fought in the Second World War alongside British soldiers who, after the war was over, they got deported back to China and their families weren't informed at all. So there are still children, uh, descendants of those sailors who are still finding, about, finding out what happened to their fathers. And I think the British government released an apology like a couple of years ago um, to these families. But yeah, this is all like part of history that even as a huge history nerd that I didn't know about. So yeah, so a lot of documentary reading, a lot of um, textbook readings, a lot of like going to museums and actually like talking to people. So yeah, that's sort of some of, sums up the research. Mm. You, obviously, yeah, you, you spend a lot of time in the UK for your studies, but d did you spend some time in Hong Kong um, on the ground to get a sense of place to inform your writing? Um, I really wished, um, when I was writing this book, I really wish, at first, I wasn't going to write it until I've been back to Hong Kong. So growing up, me and my family would go quite a few times because my dad has friends there and we would go back, I think, like more than five times when I, when I was young. So before I started writing this book, I was like, oh, I need to go back to Hong Kong. So like, so. I, I can be able to write this book, but then COVID happened. Yeah. <laughs> so I got stuck in Scotland and I was like, okay, there's nothing else to do. So I'll just write this. <laughs> so, um, I, so I really want to go back to Hong Kong to like um, get the feel of the place again because it's been a few years. But yeah, and unfortunately, no for the writing of this book, but I still have very strong, vivid memories of visiting with my family. So those help. Why did you choose uh, time traveling as a theme? Um, yeah, this is also <laughs> a very interesting question. Um, I've always um, loved stories about time travel, even though I don't read a lot of sci-fi, but I would love stuff like Doctor Who. And um, yeah, because I feel like time traveling is such an interesting tool to use in literature or movies because it's, it can be used a lot to explore grief and loss and longing, because I feel like what makes time traveling such a, the bells and whistles of time traveling so exciting is that this idea that you can go back to the past and revisit an event that you really want to see, or you want, or you can go back and see someone you really miss. But what is fascinating about time travel is that even though you have that ability to travel back in time, you can't really beat time. So even though so like things like grief and loss are still things that you can't avoid. So I feel like using time travel as a tool, like literary tool, is a very fast, th there's a lot you can do with that in terms of exploring human emotion. 
Absolutely. Now, uh, your novel is set in the UK and Hong Kong across different decades. How do you keep track of the plot and the characters and the times and when they were traveling? And, and, and did you have some kind of visual map, a visual aid to work out what the hell was going on? <laughs> Um, I had a timeline, so I had to make my own timeline of like um, it starts with like um, the grandparents, when were they born, where were they born, and then just important dates in the family's like lives. So, yeah, so I had to do that. It did get a bit confusing, like many times. It did get a l like confusing. Like <laughs> it took a lot of like different like rounds of edits, and my editor had to be like, oh. Should that character appear there, or sh like, w should the year be different? And I'm like, oh yeah, I should. I'm bad at math. Let's fix that. <laughs> Stuff like that. So that happened a lot. <laughs> now, uh, you wrote most of the novel in Edinburgh, in in Scotland. I, I was actually there a couple of weeks ago. It, the city has such a magical vibe. It, it's gorgeous, uh, medieval, Georgian, and neoclassical yeah. architecture. Um, it's also the city where J.K. Rowling wrote much of the Harry Potter series. How much did the Edinburgh surroundings inspire your writing? Um, a lot. I think, like, um, in a physical sense, it's um, a city where you can walk, which is different from Bangkok. <laughs> Very different from Bangkok. Like, in Edinburgh, you can just go out of your door and be like, okay, you can walk for five minutes and then you hit a river and then you can walk by the river, river for like an hour. So I think that puts you in a different mindset in terms of like creativity. But I also, um, so that really helped. And another aspect of being in Ed Edinburgh that really helped was that I got to meet friends who are other writers. So growing up in Thailand, I, I never met any other writers or any other like friends who want to be novelists or like writing short stories or poems or anything like that. So when I was in Edinburgh, having that community of other writers from different um, places in the world, like I had like American friends, British friends, like it was just a very nurturing environment. It just really helped in terms of encouraging me to write and also challenging me as a writer as well. So those are the two big like advantages of being in Scotland. <laughs> When did you first realize you wanted to be a writer? Um, I think when I was 12, <laughs> I think, around the same time when you realized you wanted to be a journalist. <laughs> but like before that, I would read a lot growing up, so I would read all the time. Um, so my parents had to sit me down and be like, don't read too much, because I was literally just like reading all the time at dinner, at malls, like it was a bit insane. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I would write little like short stories and cartoon strips for my siblings. But then, I, and I would tell stories to myself. It was a bit, yeah, again, a little bit unhinged. <laughs> so I would like walk around a tennis ball, like bounce, bounce a tennis ball around the house and just tell stories to myself. <laughs> but then, <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite unhinged. And then, but it didn't like clock until I was like 12 when I started, uh, when, when I think, I. I think in Thailand it would be like Mateyom Nung, so like grade seven, when I realized, oh, I love reading, I love writing, why don't I try to become a writer? Why, yeah, so that's, I think that's when I was 12, it kind of clocked, oh, this is probably the only thing I can sort of semi get by at, <laughs> so, yeah. Tell me about the space where you write and, and what your, your writer's desk looks like. Yeah, I don't really have a writer's desk. Oh. Yeah. Um, so where do you write? Um, at coffee shops and in my bed. <laughs> so there's like no, I'm I'm very bad at writing inside the house. So I can't. I think every writer is different. Like for me, I can't just wake up in the house and just go straight to writing at a table. Like I would have to go outside, like drive around, walk around, and then. I would have to go to a coffee shop and sit down and have a different surrounding in order to write. And if that doesn't work, it has to be like very late at night in my bed. So I don't really have an organized writing desk <laughs> at all. How do you generate your ideas when, when you are working on a huge project like a, a novel that, I don't know, might be 80,000 words long? Uh, plagiarism. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, I always say that I, I don't believe I'm a writer with a lot of imagination. <laughs> this sounds weird, but 
I feel like most of the stuff I write are from my own experiences or the experiences of people I know. So for me, when I generate ideas, it's mostly me just ruminating a lot on my own experiences, on my own emotions, and kind of dramatizing it, if that makes sense. And sometimes um, what helps is also like reading other books and watching movies and watching TV shows and being inspired by the way other people tell their stories. And that helps a lot, yeah. So yeah, plagiarism. <laughs> and just my own like personal experiences kind of dramatize. How do you know when the book is finished? Hmm. Is this, uh, that's a good question. I think for me, I realize um, the, um, the book is finished. All I need more help is when I don't know what else to do with it. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of stuck to, I don't know. Like, maybe if I feel like, oh, it's missing something, I don't know what it is. Or I feel like I don't have anything else to add. And I feel like that's, that's when you know, like, you need it reach it has reached a certain point where you need, for example, like with me, I need my agent's help or I need like an editor. So I think that's, yeah, when I finally, when I feel like there's nowhere else to go. Hmm. Um, what is it with you and, and Bruce Lee? You, you once wrote a, a dissertation uh, about East Asian representation in mainstream American cinema and television from 1970 to 2013. And you reflected on how Bruce Lee became the first prominent Asian actor to deconstruct the old stigma about the yellow peril and introduce his own brand of male Asian identity to Hollywood. <laughs> And Bruce Lee has a, a cameo in your novel. Yeah, it's why, very nerdy. <laughs> why is he such an important cultural figure and influence for you? I think as a person, I'm, um, I'm generally very fascinated by cultural icons, period. So I'm very fascinated by larger than life human beings, or like these people we see as icons. So that's one fascination already. And also, um, growing up, like, my dad loves Bruce Lee. And, like, in Chinese families, like, Bruce Lee is such a huge figure, and he represents so much. So I always feel like when I was writing about time travel, they would have to go to a very, in order to demonstrate how fun or how exciting otherworldly this skill is, I wanted to find a time period or a figure from history that would wow like Asian families or like Chinese families. And it was, could only ever be Bruce Lee. And I also find him so fascinating as a human being because I think he straddled the East and the West in a very fascinating way. And if you, most, of, most people think he's just this action star, but he's actually a very deep thinker and he's a philosopher. And he's, um, I think you can read a lot of his journals. I think this, his journals have been published. So I think his way of thinking and the way he, what, how, what he embodies as, like, what he represents as a figure of Asian masculinity is something that I wanted to, to um, like touch on a little bit in the novel. And also Asian masculinity is a big theme in the book as well. So I felt like Bruce Lee just makes sense. <laughs> now the moon represents my heart. It's a family story. Um, and in the acknowledgement section, you talk about your best friend, your brother Paul. <laughs> Did your brother-sister relationship with Paul influence the way that you wrote the Tommy and Eva brother-sister dynamic? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, my, my brother Paul is two years younger than me, but I sometimes feel like we're twins a bit because he's like my best friend. So, um, so that definitely impacts uh, the characters in the book. Like our relationship inspired that dynamic a lot. And I also think it's very interesting that um, he's a guy and like I'm a girl. And I feel like in Chinese family, um, being a girl and being um, a boy it's very two very different experiences. Um, so my relationship with my dad or my grandfather would be totally different than my brother's relationship with our dad and our grandfather, even though there are similarities. The fact that um, he's a boy and I'm a girl represents like different experiences. And I feel like that's why I wanted to have two siblings in the story so we can reflect these two different 
journeys and these two different experiences. Now, you, you've talked about how you've drawn on family law to, to write the novel. Uh, when your family members were reading it, what was their reaction to sort of seeing themselves represented on the page? Uh, my brother just finished uh, reading it last night. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know. I don't think I can answer for them. But I think, like, um, my brother, when he started reading it, he said, oh, this book is very you. That's what he said. It's just like, oh, the emotions and the characters are very, like, me. Like, <laughs> just how I am as a person. So I think, I think it is definitely interesting and definitely a bit emotional. I think, like, especially for my dad, I think, because there's so much of his life and my granddad's life in it. So, yeah, I think it's definitely a bit emotional, <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 I'm going to come over and chat to Pim's parents. <laughs> God. <laughs> I apologize. No, sorry. <laughs> well, what did you think when you were reading the, the novel? Well, it, it's so much Pim. I <laughs> uh, see Pim throughout all the pages, and it, it's quite healing, and it's quite, yeah, I, I really enjoy it because she really described all the emotion in details and so captivating to me, uh, it's just nice. Yeah. Um, so in awe that she could really understand all this emotion, you know. And as a family, if myself personally, I feel is, yeah, it just somehow I think probably allow me to understand her more. Yeah. yeah. And, and what about digging into that family history, your life in, in Hong Kong, your, your parents' life in Hong Kong, like d d did it ring true? Oh, I, I feel so honored that she brought all these things into the book, you know. And uh, yeah, it means so much for me. You see, personally, I grew up in Hong Kong, the war, the war city. And yeah, when she interviewed me about my relationship with my dad, I think it was quite healing for me too. You see, I mean, in Chinese family, we have the very weird dynamic, you know. In, I don't know how much you understand the Chinese family dynamic is so, especially my, my dad generation and my generation and then their generation, the, the, the world changed so much, you know, between these three generations. So we, are, we were all learning how to really handle relationship with each other, you know, and yeah, so. And, w and what do you think, Pim's mom? <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, I haven't started reading it. <laughs> 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 well, you've got some homework, don't you? <laughs> My mom will be reading the Thai translation. <laughs> What's the most difficult thing, Pim, about writing male characters? Male characters? <laughs> Making them likeable? <laughs> <laughs> Like, um, I don't know, maybe I need to elaborate on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think um, maybe likeable is the wrong word, but sort of make you want to like root for them mm. in a way. Because I felt like so much of the book is about, because if you read the book, um, the main character, Tommy, the son, is very messy. And he's also very lost and very confused. And I think my main struggle in writing him was that, uh, also writing the dad, Joshua, as well, was that um, I want readers to um, not necessarily agree with every choice they make, but to understand why they're making them and to have empathy for where they're coming from, even though their actions might be hurting other people. So I think that's the heart, that's the struggle, kind of like making sure that the hearts of the character, of the characters are evident, even though their actions can be very all over the place. Yeah. And I also, oh, another thing is that um, it was very, it was a challenge trying to kind of write that, um, like I think I had to talk to my brother a lot about like his um, struggle to kind of find his own identity in the shadow of like, other male figures in his life. Mm. So I think that's that that was another like difficult thing that I had to like pin down. Hmm. Um, 
We're going to take a, a, a short break. I was just wondering if there's any audience questions. Does anyone uh, have a burning question for Pim? No. Oh, over here. All right, I'm, I'm going to come over with the mic. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess my question is, uh, how do you feel like, do you feel like this novel has your tininess in there as well? Or do you feel like it's, it's really like mostly your Chinese heritage? Oh, this is an, I've never been asked this question before. It's really, really interesting. Um, to be honest, I don't feel like there's a lot of my tininess in this book. Well, maybe like a little bit in terms of Thai culture and Chinese culture that intersect. Um, I think the way the romantic relationship dynamics play out in the books, some of them I feel like really mirror Thai culture. I know this is very difficult to explain, but there are some like certain, maybe certain dynamics between the characters that are what you would find in Thai society a little bit. So I think more of that, but I feel like yeah, not a lot of my China is in this. A lot of my Chinese side <laughs> has been put into this. And I'm hoping that my second book would be more Thai, because the characters would be Thai, are Thai in that one. So. It wasn't really a criticism. I was just wondering if you felt Oh, no, no, no. I didn't take it as criticism. I did take but it is a very interesting question. Like, no one has asked me that. And I didn't, like, it did make me think, like, oh, are, are there aspects of the book that are Thai? And I think... Yeah, to answer the question, yeah, those relationship dynamics between the characters, I think. I think maybe it's those parts that the Chinese culture and Thai culture sort of intersect, I think, yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, just now that you are working on a second novel. How is it going? And can Terribly. You <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you give us a bit of a sneak peek? Uh, so, it's about um, Thai, uh, two Thai people. So... As opposed to this one, it's very self-contained. Um, it's, it's about love, which makes it more difficult to write, maybe, than this one. And it doesn't span like decades and continents. It's just a very self-contained... It's, I would say it's a bit like normal people, Sally Rooney, normal people, um, but with like a dash of magical realism and just Thai people being messy. Are they time travelers as well? No, they're not time travelers, <laughs> thank God. Because I don't think I can do the whole like timeline again. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like to do when you're not writing? Um, um, watch a lot of movies. I watch a lot of movies. I, sometimes I read a lot. I read a lot, but I haven't read as much as I want to lately. And I just hang out with my friends and family. Just, just normal stuff. And is writing a full-time gig or a, a, a part-time sort of side hustle at the moment for you? Um, I'm very fortunate that I can do it full-time now. So that's, that, that it has its pros and cons. I feel like sometimes as a full-time writer, when you're not writing, you constantly feel guilty. So you're like, you have to be writing. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I write full-time now. How would you characterise the, the Thai literary scene? Like, there's been... Uh, a lot of buzz uh, lately around um, some young Thai authors who are writing in English, including Maynard Dawn and his sister uh, Sunusi uh, Manning. It, is, is it having a bit of a moment on the international stage? Oh, that's a big question to unpack. <laughs> um, I think it's very exciting that there are more um, up-and-coming young Thai writers or like um, writers, Asian writers in general. Um, but I do feel like most um, writers, most Thai writers that um, find success abroad or that get um, published abroad are mostly Thai writers who grew up in the States or they, who grew up like outside of Thailand. So I still feel like it's still very rare for Thai, Thai people from Thailand, Thai writers to um, have that bigger audience. So I feel like there's still like a long way to go in terms of nurturing that talent. What are the barriers and the challenges for uh, Thai writers to gain international recognition? Yeah, this is a question that I've been asked a, a few times when I've done like interviews with like Thai magazines. And it's definitely a very big question to unpack. I think, um, 
it takes a lot of, like for me, I feel like um, being in this position, I'm very privileged that I'm able to be in this position because of like things that maybe other ties or other writers don't have access to. Um, I think like the biggest obstacle in Thailand, I would say, is education. Like I feel like Thai, Thai kids or Thai students or young Thai people aren't taught to write in a way that maybe um, someone who grew up in the West would be. Like for example, in Thai schools, we are not, uh, we don't have like, for example, like literature class. We don't sit around reading books and discussing and writing essays or learning how to um, articulate our thoughts in words. So mostly it would just be a teacher coming in that's how I grew up. <laughs> a teacher coming in, writing something on the blackboard, and then we memorize it for the exam. So I think this takes away, um, this doesn't help Thais, um, young Thai people to do critical thinking or to explore their creativity or even learning basic skills of writing. So I feel like if it would really, I think that's the biggest obstacle because we don't have that culture in Thailand. And also, there's also this um, belief, maybe wrong, wrongly placed belief that writing in English is somehow more, so is somehow superior than writing in Thai, or like writing in English has more merit than writing in Thai, which is which, in, which is not true at all. And I think that sort of discourages maybe Thai writers from thinking that they have something to say. That makes sense. What would be your advice to young Thai wannabe writers? Um, <laughs> I've had like a couple of like amateur writers like asking me this, I, and that I always say like just write, read and write a lot. Like reading really helps, and just reading and writing, like finding your voice. It doesn't matter if what you write is terrible. Um, just try it out. Just experiment. Write and. Find a way to share your writing, even though you feel like no one is reading it. Like, find a way to like share it, even though it's like online on Instagram. Like, start your own blog. Just whatever. Just find a way to like share your writing and and just yeah, just keep writing. I think that's the biggest, biggest, biggest like advice. Authors these days uh, have to spend a lot of time marketing and and social media promotion to sell their books. How do you manage that and do you find it a bit of a distraction from the creative writing process or, or do you enjoy that? Um, yes and no. <laughs> I think this is hard. I think like, um, yeah, I think, yeah, this is a difficult question to answer. I don't <laughs> even know. I think, um, I think I enjoy engaging with people who read my work. So I do enjoy that. And um, because I feel like, Writing is such an isolated profession, so it, it's really nice when you're not in a vacuum. So you can like bounce ideas off of someone else, and then you really, really find out whether your writing has resonated. So I do enjoy that part of it, and I'm also quite like a chatty person in general. I'm not a very like I'm not quiet and mysterious. So <laughs> I feel like most of the time. I don't think I like promote my 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 book in a sense. I just like live my life <laughs> in a way. So like sometimes I'm on Instagram, I just post like stupid stuff, like silly stuff, and sometimes I just like post them on my book. I just feel like if something doesn't feel natural to me, I don't do it. So I I use that policy. So I do think sometimes. So I don't feel like this enormous pressure to like promote it. So I mostly just do what it feels natural. Hmm. Maybe that doesn't really answer the question. <laughs> what's it like when you do read, sorry, what's it like when you, you do meet uh, people who have spent, I don't know, a couple of days reading a novel that uh, you have spent a year and a half writing? Um, it's definitely kind of surreal and a bit strange because I feel like at first I'm just like, wow, someone's reading it. That's, that's, I know that sounds weird, but when you're writing it, and then even when you find out that it's getting published, you don't actually think someone's going to go out and buy it. I know this sounds weird, <laughs> but like, you, yeah, I'm like, no one's going to read this. So it's very strange. And also, it's, 
it can be intimidating because you're like, oh, I hope they enjoy it. But I also kind of like, oh, I hope they're being honest and don't say they like it when they actually don't and stuff like that. It's just a very weird experience. But I do enjoy like meeting people who've read it because usually most of the time they would have like a story of their own, like a family story, or sometimes they would like really connect with the title of the book because usually if they're Chinese, they would know the song and they would have a family memory attached to the song that they usually share with me, which I find very, like, I feel very honored that they would do that. Let's talk about the upcoming Netflix series. Tell us about the, the auction for the TV rights. It, it obviously generated quite a buzz at, at the time. Uh, how, were you, how were you feeling that day? Um, I still feel like it's something that happened to someone else. <laughs> so it's a very surreal experience. So what happened is that the book's been optioned. Um, for those who don't know, like a book being optioned means that someone bought the, uh, has brought, bought the rights to have it adapted to a movie or a limited series or a TV show. But um, what happened? It doesn't mean that it's like guaranteed that it's going to get green lit for sure because in Hollywood anything can happen, things can fall through. But there's there've been good progress so far, so that's been very reassuring. But I didn't expect for it to get that much attention and interest to the point that it went, went to auction, because that, that was in, that's insane. Um, I always find it very interesting that there was so much interest in Hollywood, while there was so, the, it was so disproportionate, the interest in Hollywood versus the interest in publishing in the UK. Like when it went out to like publishers in the UK, there was like one publisher who was interested, but when it went out to Hollywood, it became like, an insane like bidding war, which is strange, <laughs> but yeah. So it do, it did made me think about oh why why is it is it because like the publishing industry is still way more traditional and white than Hollywood and yeah. So it's a, been a very I don't know what the right word is interesting journey so far. I feel like I'm always constantly learning new things and yeah, it's surreal. How has the TV series project potentially being affected by the writer's strike that's going on in Hollywood? Well, yeah, so it's halted. <laughs> so we, um, we have a screenwriter who's attached, so he, she's been commissioned to write the pilot, but because of the writer's strike, it's sort of halted. So, yeah, so I think, yeah, it's basically halted. <laughs> so that must be a bit frustrating. It is a bit frustrating, but I also think that um, it's the strike is important. I feel like people are striking for a reason, and um, the screenwriter, the 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 woman who's like in charge of adapting it, she's very like on the front lines, like um, protesting. So it's a very important strike, and it's a I think a very important moment in Hollywood. So I do think that yeah, it's needed. It's something that's important, even though projects are affected, like, mm. obviously. But obviously, yeah, a bit of patience required. Uh, some authors like to be quite hands-on with screen adaptations and involved in the writing process. Others like to be completely hands-off. What role will you play? Um, technically, I have executive producer credit, ah. uh, which means that um, they can run things by me. So I, um, they've been very, very nice in terms of making sure that um, creative, creative, creatively, the heart of the story remains. So they would send me like um, pitches of what what they would change, like what new characters they're gonna add and stuff like that. So they would run things by me. So I'm very lucky that I get to provide provide feedback in that sense. And Gemma's been very like considerate and collaborative when it comes to that too. And do you anticipate that you'll go on set? I feel like it's such a long way <laughs> to <laughs> do that. Do you want period. to go on set? Yes, I would love to go on set, but I do feel like I'm trying to like pace myself and not get ahead of myself and be like, oh my god, it's gonna, everything's gonna like get get like done without a hitch, without a hitch and stuff like that. So I'm still kind of like, hmm. <laughs> We obviously don't know how long this writer strike is, is is going to carry on for, but do you have any sense of time frame on on when the series might come out? Like, is it, I don't know, five years away? 
Um, I have no idea. Because before the strike, things was going quite fast. Mm. And they was like, oh, if things are going on track, we can go into production by the end of the year and stuff like that. So it was a bit insane. But then the strike, the strikes have happened. So now I'm not quite sure. <laughs> so, What are you most nervous about um, when your book becomes a TV series? Uh, it not actually becoming a TV series? <laughs> no, joking. Um, I think... Um, losing the integrity of of the of the book maybe because I it's I do understand that um, book and and TV show are two completely different medium and especially when you're with Netflix and we're under spectacle and events in Netflix which means they want the big you know like action sequences like all the bells and whistles and what you sort of have to have in keep in mind is that how how do we have that all the spectacle and stuff, but also keep the heart of the story as well. So I think that's that would be our biggest like challenge. What are you most excited about in terms of it becoming a TV series? Um, maybe it reaching an audience that would normally would not normally read, because I do think. Um, Especially today, not many people, um, because everything is so, we like things that are easily consumable. So not many people, um, we d maybe the reading culture is not as like, big as it was. Maybe I'm wrong about this. And also, um, in certain circles, like certain groups of Thais wouldn't, wouldn't read this. Not because they're not capable of doing it. It's just not their thing. It's just not for various reasons. So I think if it were to become a TV series, that would be what I'm excited about the most. Like this story, having the chance to um, um, be seen by other groups of people who would not necessarily read the book. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, when a, a book is turned into a, a screen adaptation, it, it does reach a, a new audience. and. And it also potentially propels the author to great fame and fortune. How do you feel about being on the cusp of, of being in the public spotlight? I don't feel like I'm in the public spotlight. And I feel like, I, I think like the word like famous and writers don't usually go together because I feel like unless you're J.K. Rowling level, no one really cares like who writes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think I'm, maybe I'm not very equipped to answer this question because I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> I just, yeah, uh, I was just telling you in the bathroom that I don't even know if I'm dressed right for this occasion. You look fabulous. I'm like, oh, did I do my makeup well? Like, I, I suck in makeup. Like, do I tuck my shirt in and stuff like that? Or do I leave it hanging out? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I don't think I'm made for, <laughs> like, a famous writer's life. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'm curious what your own policy is on this. Uh, do you read a book first, or do you sometimes watch the TV series or the, or the film and Ooh. then read the book later? Well, I think it depends on, like, which one I come across first. Ah. Yeah, like, for example, like, um, I started watching Game of Thrones, the TV series, first. I think I watched the first season, I think, and then I read all the books. So I think it depends. And um, there are certain books that I read first, like, for example, Daisy Jones and the Six. I, like, read the book first, and then I watched the TV show. So I think it depends on um, when the story spoke, like, which medium of the story, like, spoke to me first. Hmm. We know that there's an underrepresentation of Asian stories, Asian characters, and actors in, in sort of Western cinema and television. We also know that there's, there's been a lot of stereotyping about what it means to be Asian. What kind of impact do you hope the Netflix series will, will have on Thai or, or, or Chinese youngsters? Um, I really hope this. Uh, huh. This is also a big question. <laughs> um, I hope it would have an impact, not just as a TV series, but maybe like as a book, maybe even just as a book. So I do feel like um, growing up, I've, I don't um, read, because if you're growing up in Asia and you're consuming 
books or movies in English, you don't see a lot of yourself in those stories. So you just sort of have to um, relate to white characters, which is fine, um, <laughs> which is fine. But I do think that is such a shame because there's just a variety of stories that we're missing out on. And I hope that just a little bit of diversity, I, I hate using the word diversity, but it sounds like a like, corporate thing, but like just having like different kind of stories than what we're generally used to will help us all connect more to our own humanity and to sort of like open our eyes or open our world and open our understanding of us as a human race. I think that's, yeah, I, I hope that having more Asian writers would accomplish that and also help, uh, maybe this is too deep of a tangent to go, on, <laughs> to go into, but I do feel like for Asian readers who like discover these stories, I hope that it makes them feel a little bit more seen or feel a little bit more proud of their heritage or where they come from. Because I remember when I was growing up and I wanted to be a writer, I felt like I really had no chance because I felt like my stories, if I were to write about things that I know, no one would read it because it, it, it would be boring because I've never seen any of, those, any of those stories on the page at all. So I would feel like I would have to have a white name or I would have to write about white characters um, to, to have that audience at all. And I also feel like growing up in Asia, there's an underlying sense that whiteness is something to be aspired to still. And I think having more of our stories in the main, quote unquote mainstream, it would ho help hopefully help like the average Thai person or average Chinese person to kind of find more, doesn't see whiteness as superior as maybe people from my generation did and kind of feel more seen as who they are. Maybe that's too long of an answer, <laughs> but yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great answer. Uh, I'm interested in um, which Thai authors, um, and more broadly, which Asian authors have, have influenced your writing over the years. Hmm. Um, I really love um, Celeste Ng. I, I'm, Ng I'm, uh, I shouldn't know how to pronounce the last name. But uh, she wrote um, Little Fires Everywhere. And everything I never told you. Um, everything um, most people would know. Little Fires Everywhere because it's made into a TV show with like Kerry Washington and Reese Witherspoon. But her debut novel, Everything I Never Told You, is amazing, and that like that novel really spoke to me. So she's someone I'm very um, inspired by. And uh, yeah, what are you reading right now? What books excite you? Um, I'm reading um, this book, I'm, I'm not sure if it's YA, but um, it's like young adult and it's called All My Rage by um, Saba Tahir. So um, it's about um, two, I think Palestinian, oh no, not Palestinians, Pakistani teenagers growing up in America. So she's the, the writer who wrote the YA fantasy series, Embers in the Ashes, and this is her first like non-fantasy work. So that's what I'm reading at the moment. I'd like to open up the floor to audience questions. Does anyone have a question for, for Pim? Okay. Right down the front here. Thanks. If I can bring you back to the book, I have two questions. Um, one is, to what extent, if any, do you identify with Eva? And second, if you didn't use time travel, which is the other device you would use to tell the same story? Can you repeat the last part? Which if you didn't use time travel, which other device could you use to say tell the same story? Oh. Huh. Um, the first question, uh, do I um, identify with Eva as a character? Um, so for those who haven't read the book yet, Eva is the sister in the story. And um, this is an interesting question because um, I feel like I identify, I identify the most with the female characters in the book, surely, but with Eva the least. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure why. I think it's, um, I think what 
I relate it. I relate to her in terms of how she uses creativity as a prism to like view the world. Like she in the book, she's a painter. She's an artist, so she sees things in colors, or she sees things in like, yeah, how she would paint, like paint emotions and stuff like that. So I think I ad I identify with that a bit because as a writer and as someone who's quite emotional, I would <laughs> I would like see the world or see human emotions kind of in a I don't know if this makes sense, but in like a visual way. Or sometimes I watch a lot of movies too. So sometimes, like when I envision a scene, I just see it as like a movie scene. So th I think that would be something that I ad identify with, with Eva. Um, also, maybe she's a little bit of like an awkward oddball character. <laughs> and I think as a teenager, I definitely felt feel that way because uh, <laughs> yeah, because Tommy in the book, the son, he's the brother. He's this popular, happy kind of like popular, seemingly happy character who people gravitate towards. And I felt like as an as an as a teenager, I definitely feel more like Eva, who's like this oddball, awkward, I don't know where I belong kind of person. So yeah, those are the two big things that I relate with Eva. And in terms of if I don't use time traveling, how would I, how else would I tell this story? I don't think this book it would be possible without time travel as a tool, because when I started writing this book, this book, the initial idea for this book came from the premise of what would happen if someone were to become addicted to traveling back in time. So that's so that's like the kind of like that's how the book was born this idea that Tommy gets addicted to traveling back in time. So without a time travel, I don't think this book would exist. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned that uh, you already answered when you would know you'd like to be an author. Um, I'd like to ask um, also how would you become an author? Because also I'm from, a, well, I'm Thai. I'm from a Thai family that's certain expectations and baggage coming along as being an, yes. um, a Thai kind of from, from a Thai family. <laughs> um, but it sounds like um, you have started studying bachelor's in writing and then master's as well. So um, I wonder how did you come across, come into the route from like a wish to become like a career yes. hope? This is a great question. Um, I'm coming uh, when Lisa uh, like, uh, Lisa asked like what's the biggest obstacle from for Thai writers um, getting a publisher board. I think another obstacle other than education is that we don't really see we don't really know the pathway to get there. So since I've gotten this book published, many people have asked me, oh, what are the practical steps? So um, I can go through it a little bit. <laughs> I hope it doesn't take up too much of everyone's time. But yeah, um, so if you want to get, it's very different if you want to get published in Thailand and if you want to get published abroad, it's totally different. So in Thailand, you don't need an agent. So if you write a book in Thai and you want to get it published, you can submit your manuscript directly to a publisher and write a cover letter and just be like, oh, this is me. And the publisher might depending on the publisher and what they're looking for, they might look for people with more following because in Thailand there's a, a trend of like oh, viral, like being viral online. So it depends on what kind of writing you're doing. But for getting published abroad, um, I decided to um, study um, creative writing for my postgrad because like you, I actually had no idea how to actually do this. So before I went to do my postgrad, I was writing um, f uh, freelance articles on culture, um, movie movie reviews, TV show reviews, and I was publishing it on my blog that no one reads, and pitching it to like various like magazines and like literary journals in Southeast Asia. So by doing that, I got kind of like contact, I got connections with like editors or like so, and they sort of. That helps a lot because that helps like refine your writing and also kind of help you kind of get in the business a bit. But when it comes to a novel, if you want to get published abroad, you need an agent. So that's a big thing. Publishers don't look at your manuscript if you if you don't have an agent. So um, a literary agent is sort of like a sports agent that represent you. So so what you need 
um, it's different um, if it's nonfiction and fiction. But if it's fiction, you need to have a finished manuscript. So have a finished manuscript. Make sure it's in the best condition. So before I sent it out to agents, I had I did like a couple of edits like by myself, and then I sent it out to some of my friends and asked them for feedback as well. I had very specific questions. For example, oh, does this part work? Is this part too boring? Does this character work for you? Like very specific questions. And then I edited it again. This is very technical. <laughs> and then I start, um, we call this process querying agents. So what happens is that I, I wanted to get published in the UK because I was living in the UK and I, like, I'm very familiar with um, being in the UK. So I approached UK agents. So what I did was basically looked at all the liter literary agencies in the UK. And then I chose kind of like my top five and top ten agents. So usually you, use, you choose agents based on, um, sometimes you look at your favorite authors and who they're represented by. Or you go onto like the agency's website and agents would have their information on that and they would list what they're looking for. For example, they, they would say, I'm only looking for YA or I'm looking for historical fiction, blah, blah, blah. So you make a list of your top five, top ten. You have and then you send them a cover letter. Firstly, the first thing is a cover letter um, introducing yourself and introducing your book. So you have to have an elevator pitch. Like I said, my eleva elevator pitch was that it's Time Traveler's Wife meets the Joyla Club. It helps to have a comparative title. So you have that, introduce yourself, introduce your book, cover letter. Second thing you have is the, f you send them is the first three chapters of your book. And the third thing you send them is a chapter outline of your whole novel. So they want to know what happens from the beginning to the end. So a, then a, an agent can get up to like a thousand submission a year. So sometimes a querying can take like, can take like a year or two years. It's insane. It's very nerve wracking. So you send it out. If they like the first three chapters or if your cover letter like appeals to you, they will ask for the full manuscript and then you send them the full manuscript, and that can also take a long time for them to read it. And, but then if an agent is interested, they would get in touch with you and say, oh, I'm interested in representing you. And if you have one offer, it helps you to like, notify other agents to be like, oh, I have an offer now, are you interested as well? And that, that helps speed things up. So, when you have so now when you have representation, the agent would then work on editing the book with you a bit more, and then they would send it out to publishers. So what qu querying the publisher would sort of be like us querying the agents. So the agents will send it out to publishers, pitch, pitch it to the publishers, and give them a deadline, and wait to, wait, to, wait to hear back from the publishers whether they're interested. So if more than one are interested, it becomes like a bidding war, and then you sort of have to choose. But if there's only one person who's interested, you, you take it. And if n no one's interested, then you go back to the drawing board. So yeah, that's, I'm sorry if that took a long time, but that, those are the practical steps. Thank you yeah. so much. You're welcome. Uh, I wanted to know that given that some of the book is set in Hong Kong, did you or your publisher perhaps uh, face any sort of legal challenges? Did you have to have the government approve it or any, given the current climate in Hong Kong? Um, no, not at all. So because this book is just, um, not the whole book is that that, and there's, if you read, it's not political at all, at all, so it's just set that. So yeah, we've had no qualms about that in terms of like the setting at all. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. Thank you. Um, how important was it for your own process to leave Thailand? in order to be able to reflect on some of the cultural dynamics that are present in Thai Chinese families? And was there anything in particular that you only realized in Scotland or in the UK um, from being removed from the context? And then perhaps also when you couldn't travel during COVID and you were thinking so much about um, life here, um, how was that process for you? Um, I'll answer the first question first. <laughs> Yeah, um, I lived, I, the first time I lived in the UK was when um, I did my undergrad, so I think I was like 18, 19. 
So that's when I moved um, from Thailand to live abroad like full time. And I was also working in a bookshop while I was studying. So it's a whole like different experience. And like you said, I think being removed from, because I've lived in Thailand all my life before that point, it really helped me like open my eyes about in terms of um, to like so many things that you don't realize why you're like living in it. Like I think, um, I think one big thing that I realized like, was how, um, maybe this sound, this might sound harsh, but it's quite like misogynistic Thai society is until I was like removed from it in a way. And I touch on it a little bit um, in my um, previous uh, answer um, when I was talking about how, um, how Thai people are kind of like conditioned to view ourselves in relation to white people as well. Like I think these are dynamics that I didn't fully realize or question until I went abroad and I was exposed to other different types of cultures or I was exposed to these kind of conversations more. Like for example, like growing up in Thailand, people Thai people would come up to me and be like, "Oh my god, you're so white. Like you're so pale. I want to be as pale as you." So like growing up, I don't quest I didn't question any of this. But when living abroad and being exposed to different types of culture and different ways of thinking, it made me more, like, it made me realize all these issues more and more. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Does this help? And the second question was um, writing in Scotland during COVID. Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. Like, be, like I said, like I didn't think I could write this book without visiting Hong Kong first and having that experience. But for some reason, like I was able to do it. <laughs> I think it's because it was. I think what was more important was the personal journey because a lot of this book is, despite all these like far-fetched settings. The heart of this book is um, the dynamic between like father and child or like mother and child and unlocking that family, I don't know what to call it, that family issue, that family like struggle dynamic. And I think that was more of like a personal journey that I didn't need to be in Thailand or I didn't need to be specifically in a specific place in order to, to go through that. I think maybe the benefits of being in Scotland is that maybe I'm a little bit more removed and I felt like I had the space to sort of write it and like explore that without the, I don't know, quote unquote responsibilities of home maybe. That made it a tiny bit easier, but mo most of it is just like because it's a personal journey. So I didn't really need to be in Hong Kong for it. Thank you. Um, I was curious, you said something about a translation. Is there a translation into Thai, Chinese, and um, are, have you read them? Are they good? <laughs> what are you thinking about them? So uh, right now, it's going to be translated into Italian, quite random, Italian, Russian, very random, uh, Italian, Russian, Indonesian, Spanish, and Thai, yes. So it's going to be published by Amarin. So yeah, I know who's going to be doing the translating and we have a title in Thai. So it's very exciting. So I, I feel like for the other languages, because I'm not personally, like have a personal attachment, <laughs> I feel like I don't really mind what the translation, like. As long as it's like decent, it's fine. But like for the Thai version, I would, I think I would like to like have a read and see what it's like. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's quite emotional that it's going to be in Thai. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Oh, oh, oh sorry, over here. Um, sorry to ask you this when your parents are here, but. Um, okay. <laughs> How do you convince um, your family that being a writer is a viable career path? <laughs> I mean, you are successful, but how was it at the beginning? 
Uh, this is hard because I feel like my parents aren't the typical Thai parents. So my, maybe my answer would be unhelpful <laughs> for you. But yeah, I think, um, I think what helps is that my, my, especially my dad, he's quite a creative person as well. So like growing up, he would tell us like stories he made up. So I think that helps the fact that he has that creative side to him. And I think what, maybe speaking generally for like Asian parents or like um, quote unquote minority parents, I think like um, what's hard for them is that they don't see careers, creative careers as having much merit because they don't see how it's going to manifest into an actual profession, an actual career with, with money and with like income and with, it's definitely not, um, it's definitely not a secure career path compared to maybe like a nine to five with a steady income. But I think um, more and more with how with the world is today, I think like with the internet and stuff like that, I think there are more creatives pursuing creative careers because I think with the way the world is, there's more chance of you getting your stuff out there and there's more chance of people finding those things. So I think, I think, for, the, I think for parents, like maybe I'm very bad at answering this. I'm not equipped to answer this, but maybe like... I think what's important is that them seeing it, c kind of like seeing it like come to, come to life. If that makes sense. So maybe this is a very maybe this example doesn't help. But I have a friend who's um, British Ghanaian. Um, he's an author as well, and his debut novel um, just came out this this year as well. Um, it's called Small Joys. It's amazing. Everyone should get it. Um, but yeah, um, he he once shared to me that his mother doesn't understand, like didn't understand what he was doing as well. But he was just so determined in doing it that he was just like, he was just, he just did it. He just wrote his novel while he was working uh, a full-time job as well. So he just, just committed to getting it done. And now that he, now he's a full-time writer, he, he's able to quit his job, he, he has a book out and he has like a book launch. And so he said that now that his mom has seen how it all comes together, she understands it more. So maybe this helps a bit. I think like with parents, it's, I think it's because they worry that you won't have income or you, it's, not, it's gonna be a dead end, but I think what helps is that them seeing how it can play out, if that helps. <laughs> please, please put your hands together for Pim. Now we have copies of uh, Pim's book for sale here at the club. Pim uh, has very kindly agreed to uh, sign uh, copies of her book tonight. So um, please come up and have a chat. And uh, thank you all for coming this evening. A quick note before we wrap up, uh, next Wednesday here at the FCCT, we have a panel discussion on Thai politics entitled Moving Forward or Moving Backwards. It's at <laughs> 7 p.m. Don't miss it. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much for having me.